So I want to welcome you to week four. We are almost done. We have only one week left. Our agenda for today is an intro to data encoding and compression. That's also going to be dealing with, again, specifically encoding, compression, storing, and compressed file formats. So first part is, let's get into our intro. What exactly is data encoding and what exactly is compression? So data encoding is a way for us to encode data so that it becomes meaningful information or so that we can encode data in such a way for us to be able to quickly access data or access that data so that we can turn it into that competitive advantage or we can turn it into that information that we need to actually then form a competitive advantage. Because we live in the 21st century, information and information flow are the new base of power for our businesses. What I mean by that is information flow and information itself, meaningful data, is becoming a new power. Organizations that have a really good informational flow, they're actually able to collect, put out a product that uh, consumers want because of based off of good information that's going to lead to a competitive advantage. If you don't have a way to streamline information flow, whether it be from consumers to the actual patrons that produce or manufacturers, if there's not a good flow there, then you're going to waste time, you're going to lose customer base. It's this long-term longevity of revenue services are going to go down. Information and informational flows that are decent will at least allow for a reduction in lost revenue. Now what I mean by lost revenue is that it, it may not be so much actual lost revenue, but it could be potential lost revenue as well. So IT, how does that work within this data encoding information information flow process? IT can be thought of as a system that interconnects everything. They do not work for a specific department, they work for all departments. And a big thing there is the creation, exchange, storage, the collaboration between those departments are normally facilitated through IT. Within a business, every department there is normally there to help generate uh, funds. IT is one of the, the major departments that actually allows other departments to generate funds. Uh, modern, uh, modern IT systems allow organizations, businesses, manufacturers the ability to actually create, analyze, and store vast amounts of data. And what I mean by that is, so we've talked about data leaks before, we've talked about big data before, but here we're actually starting to see how much data can organizational or organizations put together so that they can start analyzing this data. And how much is big data? How large is big data? And that's all a really big thing. Big data is very situational. It's when an organization has too much data for itself to be able to easily manage, then it becomes big data. Size for this really isn't meaningful. So what are problems with big data or vast amounts of data? And that is how to, first of all, how to utilize it. How do we use it? How do we store it? How do we retrieve it? How do we do something meaningful with it? So computer scientists first responded uh, with the, to these questions with the development of data encoding and data compression algorithms so that we can compress data so we can store more data. Data encoding, same thing. We're trying to actually put more data on our storage technology in such a way, thus allowing us to be able to store more. The issue here is we are actually growing in uh, our data creation rate 
very quickly. And so we are actually doubling or tripling our total data normally within a few years. For example, let's say you take a uh, beginning of written history to early 20th century. If we call that our base data rate, we're doubling that normally every three to four years. And we've been doing that for easily the last 20 plus years. With the onset of smart devices, everything is generating more and more data now. So how do we do something about that? How do we utilize it? How do we organize it? Those are all questions that are normally answered with data encoding, decoding, and data compression. So how do we talk about the big data aspect of this? So computer scientists developed encoding and compression, but data scientists, data scientists, came up with the question or came up with the answer, how do we organize it? And they put forth a new methodology. How do we utilize it? Data scientists put together a whole new uh, methodology. And now how we're actually looking at data has been changed. So to understand the data storage, we must first understand the flow of data creation. How do we collect data? How do we organize data? Is it going to be raw data? Is it going to be meaningful data? What exactly do we mean with this? Initially, we started with software applications or an end user, but now any type of smart device can generate data, logs if nothing else. So how do we actually organize it? So normally we have our data written to some type of memory, normally random access memory, RAM, while uh, either the end user or application is using that information or that data. Once it's finished, the resulting data can then be actually saved to a, some type of local or network-based storage device. This could also be in terms of sensor information that is then stored on a remote server, but that way we can actually monitor all sensor logs. Sensors could be temperature, could be uh, fan speed, I mean, our uh, sensors can be lots of things. And it's at this point that our data coding really begins. So you're asking yourself, well, what is this like? Why is this important to me, the individual IT worker? One of the big things here is we have to understand what data encoding and compression is and understand how to design and support it. And that also means bringing in things like capacity. How are we going to actually estimate how much storage space we're going to need based off of a trending uh, data growth pattern? If we don't have the ability to look at current data, look at projected data uh, allocation, and then try to figure out a current storage solution that will fit that will fit or fix our problems down the line, then we have problems as an IT professional. Because this is where it's been heading. Also, you have to understand what type of uh, storage mechanisms or compression algorithms are used in everyday business or by certain SANs or NASs. That way, make sure that you're selecting the correct product or the most appropriate software to meet your needs. So one thing I've noticed when organizations do this, they think about the importance of that data, but they don't trans, uh, they don't compute the fact that that's going to cost money. A data scientist coming up with an appropriate response or a data uh, scientist coming up with an appropriate response to the information flow question, normally it needs to be purchased. Or there could be organizations out there that uh, pool their resources so that these scientists can do research in a general area for just a better understanding. Normally there are grants for, for those types of wor uh, work. It just kind of depends. But we have to understand both how encoding and compression work so that we can see if there's going to be any troubleshooting process that may need to be uh, 
brought up in an, in an individual area. Our first major area is our data encoding. So what is data encoding? Data encoding refers to the process by which a computer storage device takes the electronic signal generated from the creation of the data and then converts it into a form that can be stored. Normally, uh, it will actually be an electrical signal, two bits, on a hard drive. So to understand this process, we have to know a few things first. How is our data stored, both on a magnetic storage medium and SSDs? A big part of that is through binary, through zeros and ones, the uh, application of electricity or the absence of the electricity, thus forming a one or a zero. That way, we can actually then break everything into the binary bits and be able to restore, uh, restore it. If we're dealing specifically with magnetics, we have a head that will create the magnetic sectors on the storage device, thus pol uh, polarizing it so that we can have the corresponding positive and negative charges so the drive applies to the head. That way, is there a charge, yes or no? If there is a positive charge, then it will be a yes. If there's a negative charge, then it will be a no. So what exactly does this mean? All of this deals with being able to take data, store it long term, and in such a way that we can store, uh, store it long term electronically, not via some type of uh, disk media like a DVD or Blu-ray, but this is going to be electronic storage like on a hard drive. So these boundaries are created by using a flux reversal between the positive and negative polarities. The device uses that to encode the data. Basically, we imprint it on the disk, and then when we read from the disk, it reverses it. Again, when we write to the disk, it's one way. When we read from the disk, we reverse it. That way we can see if it's a positive or negative charge. So in its simplest form, data can be created as an output in a binary form, binary or hexadecimal form, so that the end user or the system can convert those forms in such a way for it to be stored long term electronically on a hard drive. It exists in that form until it is retrieved, and then we can convert it back to the original form. All of that so that we can take long term, we can take data, store it long term, and still be able to analyze and utilize it extremely quickly. Moving on, data compression. What is data compression? First of all, we have to understand that data itself takes up a lot of space. And the fact that it takes up lots of space, it creates very specific challenges. And a big part of that is storage. Because overall, storage is expensive. And the more storage we have, the more difficult it is to manage. And not just manage, but it also becomes extremely difficult to access in a somewhat quick uh, time frame. Thus, storage media needs to have a way to allow for quick access to the data while still allowing the large amounts or a uh, larger quantity of data to be uh, stored. So this is where our data compression comes into play. Because data takes up lots of space, we had to have a way to shrink or compress our data. And that's what we did. Data scientists came up with the process of compression so that we can squeeze large chunks of data into a smaller space. Sorry, uh, the normal analogy is we can take lots of oranges and fit them into one cup by squeezing them, emptying out the fluid and thus being only left with orange juice. That's a way for us to take 
20 or 24 or more oranges and creating one. So conceptually, so conceptually what we did was we made orange juice. But how can we take the actual orange itself and have it in its original form fit into a cup? We can't. We can actually take the orange, convert it to some type of concentrate, thus allowing us to take the innards, squish them together, and essentially dehydrate it. That way, we can actually be able to store more. In this example, if you take that concentrate, we can rehydrate it by adding water and thus getting a full pitcher of orange juice from a small amount of liquid. You can do the same analogy with Kool-Aid. You can have a very small package of Kool-Aid, apply it to a, a pitcher, add sugar, add a little bit of water, and you can make a mass amounts of Kool-Aid from one Kool-Aid package. Our data compression follows the same type of logic data is taken in the original form, converted into a numerical value that's repetitive and thus allowing us to shrink it. But how is that useful? Basically we are taking data in its original form and we're assigning it numerical value so we can actually decrease the size. For example, let's put a sentence, the cat ate the mouse. We could actually then assign each keyword a uh, digit or a number. Things like cat and mouse, they're small, so they're, they're not going to save a whole lot of space. But as we start applying that same methodology, or that same logic to larger words, we can start saving space. And it's actually it's long-term space saving. That's how you have to think about our data compression, is long-term space saving through the form of original to converted number values. That way we're not looking at individual characters like A or B or C. We could be looking at char uh, whole characters or whole sentences uh, that can be represented. So again, we've already looked at the full picture of orange juice. We've talked about how data is converted. Now let's go ahead and go on to if you want to use the information, all you have to do is then pull it out and then compress the file. That's if you want to compress it. If you want to actually use it, you would decompress it. You would put the data from its compressed form back to its original form thus allowing you to use it. While granted, yes, it does add access time to compress and decompress, but sometimes the storage space or the storage savings is worth the, uh, the access time increase. Again, it just kind of depends in your situation, your organization, which way is going to be the best method. So another way of viewing this could be, let's assume we have a textbook. We want to pull out all wasted space and vowels. So we would be able to then condense our textbook probably by half, if not more, by just removing vowels and blank spaces. Because vowels and blank, space are blank spaces actually force the wording to grow so much. So by removing them, we could actually then save space. And then if we actually wanted to be able to read it, we would just go back in, spend the time re-adding in the vowels and blank spaces, and thus allowing us to read the information. That would be compression. That's all different types of compression. Normally it's not some magic device, normally it's a mathematics and predictive or predictive ability that allows for the creation of these algorithms. Again, normally it's a mathematic computation 
that allows for these files to be compressed and then uncompressed or decompressed. The computer scientists, mathematics, who write the uh, algorithm that foster the compression allow our society the capability to support more data, to retrieve more data, and to ease issues of storage and storage management. While they, they keep saying computer scientists, this also goes towards data scientists as well, not just computer scientists. So the next challenge is how quickly can we compress and deeper, or decompress these files? That way, if we're trying to access them, how quickly can we actually save them and retrieve them? This is where the different uh, algorithms come into play because certain algorithms compress faster than others. But in general, this is where our competitive advantages are created or destroyed. If the overhead, the actual time it takes to do compression is too long, it won't last. doesn't matter how quickly or how much space it saves. If it's not quick enough, it's not going to get used. Next, to help, further uh, to help foster further uh, understanding, we have to understand some basic forms of compression. Uh, th there's two major types that are in use today, lossy and lossless compression. These are just two of the common types. These are not the only ones, but these are just common ones. Keep in mind, before I give the explanation of what lossy and lossy, or lossy and lossless compression is, we have to keep the idea for compression is to use fewer data bits to compress the data than originally were there. That way we can save space. If it is same or greater amounts of bits used to compress the data, we're not using it to save space. So keep that in mind. Lossy compression uses a process that actually discards data that the algorithm does not think anyone will notice. That doesn't mean that it's data that you will not use. It's just data that it thinks no one will be able to notice. Lossy compression was not written to recreate the discarded data, but rather to reinterpret it that was discarded and thus create the reinterpretation. Allowing data to be lost but lost in such a way that no one should be able to notice. Lossy compression process works well for audio, video, and some image files, but normally is not used for business data because, again, the lower tolerance for errors and lossy co uh, comprehension for the reinterpretation of the data could cause problems. Basically, what that means is Lossy works well for audio, video, and images, but if you try to use it in place where there is a very low tolerance for error, then Lossy is not a good compression algorithm. For example, you want a, uh, accounting data or business data of any sort. If there's any ambiguity or in reinterpretation or interpretation of the data, that could lead to problems. So. Normally, lossy is not done for business critical data. Audio, video, things of that nature. Another way to look at lossy co uh, compression is think of the ways to, the form the transcoding. Basically, it's a way to reduce the size by just moving small portions, like a phone call. We can actually cut off certain frequencies, and that by itself saves data. No one really uses those, those frequencies, so by removing them, we save space. We don't have to store those frequencies. At the same time, at the same time, that is also why people have issues with phone calls. Sometimes if you can talk to someone on the phone and they sound completely different 
than they do in person. That's because lossy actually remove certain portions of the frequency that they think no one will notice. That's lossy. If we're dealing with photos or greens, for example, lossy compression would, would actually merge the different pixel types together and then average them out. That's for photos. That way, colors could be blended. It won't be as sharp, but it does allow for smaller compressed files. Moving on, lossless compression is con considered to be the preferred compression method because it's capable of representing data more concisely. Thus, no type of reinterpretation. Most importantly, without mistakes or errors. Lossless allows for fewer mistakes. Data compression. We're talking about data compression, I'm, I'm sorry. Lossless compression in terms of data compression will work in exploiting statistical redundancies in the mathematic patterns found in the data. Basically they perform an analysis on it and they remove redundancy portions of the data and then represent those duplications in such a way or in such a manner that they can go back and they can recreate them thus allowing save space. The useful way to understand lossless com uh, compression algorithm is through what is called prediction by partial matching. This process uses a set of previous, uh, uh, previous symbols in the original uncompression data to predict the next symbol. It uses, again, statistical predictions to help finish portions. Like if you're spelling out Michael, and you don't add EL, it doesn't matter because there's only so many ways that this can be spelled out correctly. So that's a form of lossless. Uh, that's a very simplistic view of it, but that's the gist. Now, are there only one method for lossless compression? No, there are several different types of methods. Huffman coding, I mean, there are so many different types of coding that it's pretty much you have to just go through them so that you can see the benefits, the pros, the cons, disadvantages, advantages of each of them. That way they can be applied to the appropriate scenario. So let's look at some types of these codings. Huffman coding is an entropy encoding algorithm that is used during the lossless comprehension process, which we just looked at that. It uses a prefix code when predicting the next symbol. Here's a little bit of history from Huffman. He uh, had a PhD in experimentals with uh, arrangements until he found the most effective way to produce averages. I will let you guys look up more on him. His thing is very successful when using symbol by symbol encoding, but not as successful when using symbol by symbol restriction is dropped. A different type of encoding helps solve that challenge. Arithmetic, uh, arithmetic coding helps to solve that problem. That is, variables are the, the key to understanding the arithmetic coding. While Huffman encoders use an entropy encoding, the other coding uses variable entropy encoding. They're slightly different. Basically, it allows you to store more bits with using fewer bits so that, again, you can save space. that essentially allows so that mathematically you can actually use more data and it will be stored with fewer bits. The arithmetic coding encodes the messages in such a way where a single number 
that is a fraction of the original number can use to represent messages or portions of a message where Huffman encoding separates the data into component symbols and replaces each with a code. That uses a lot more space. For example, if you were to spell out M M M I I I I I K K Mike, you could actually store it instead of M M M I I I I I K K E E E E E. One way of storing that would be 3M 4I 2K 5E. That should be less than the amount of characters that would be uh, to spell out M M I I I I K K K. Because that should be 14 characters to spell out Mikey and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 characters to do 3M, 4I, 2K, 5E. We're saving 6 bits of data by doing it this way. So, I mean, that's one type of methodology. An alternative style is another type of coding. This uses a dictionary approach, thus allowing for long lines of strings to be represented by a single output value. That way we can do predefined larger strings of data that then will correspond to a num uh, another value. There are numerous approaches that uh, mathematicians, data and computer scientists have created to help increase the efficiency of our data compression. Though every new algorithm has its own new sets of problems. And IT's job is to apply their knowledge for data coding and encoding and compression to help solve organizational needs for data storage. They can also contribute a knowledge base of discovery and innovation that might create the next generation of algorithms. Or you may find a new way to demand additional space. The algorithm is, is more important, don't get me wrong, but we are always adapting and adding to our current body of knowledge, so that's an important thing. Next. Storing data and parameters. So what exactly do we mean by storing data and parameters? We're going to discuss a few items. How data is stored and tracked. How can the data be stored by the computer or located in memory? How can programmers declare variables and thus assign a certain amount of memory aside for those variables? We're turning into a programming class pretty quick. Data types. Is it a number? Is it a letter? Is it a text document? Can a number be a, both a number and a text document? Sure. Can a, a letter be a number and a alpha numeric uh, representation? Letter and a number. Sure. A could be the number 10 in hexadecimal or it could also be the letter A. This kind of depends. Oh, sorry about that. The name of the variable is a pointer to the location in memory. So we can actually say we're going to load this variable called x. We actually then, when we call the variable x, we point to that variable space in memory. With a line of code, an integer variable is declared. Normally, which is some type of define the variable name and then you assign it a data type. For example, in Visual Basic, dim, dim, variable name as what type of data type. So an example might be dim order date as date. Our variable would be called order date. Our data type will be date. Memory location referred to by the name. Here they're going to use numbers of days in the week. 
the value could be 7. And it's stored in 4 bytes memory space. Even if it's not using the entire space, it pre uh, presets that space aside for that data. That's, again, storing our parameters and storing data. Storing the data while it's in use by a program is not always the most efficient. You can actually insert, delete, change, modify during the running of a program so that we can manipulate the variable number of days in the week variable. One of the program, oh, sorry, once the program ends, the memory area should be cleared. However, that's not always the case. Sometimes programmers write it in such a way where it's persistent, meaning the data is still in memory or in a file or a hard drive stored in that physical media. Disk, removable drive, doesn't really matter. It all depends on how the programmer sets it up. A variable can be local to a program or global to a program, meaning it could be tied to a very specific function or to the overall program. For example, if you ever do save function in Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel, that's going to be one that uses local variables to save data. But you'll also notice that it's the same save button in almost every product. Here they declare local variables because that's how it's been done and they just re keep re a bit sorry. They just keep reusing the same lines of code so that they don't have to recreate the code to save a document. A global scope is something that has functionality throughout the entire program, not just a specific function of a program. <sighs> Normally, global variables are declared at the very top, outside of any specific function, while local variables are defined within a function. That way, the local variables are only known inside of that function and not outside. Though you can pass data from a function back to the main program. So that is something to also keep in mind. That could be where your local variable turns into a global variable. A variable with a local scope can only be used and charged within the function that it's declared the function can also return variables. When you're doing multifunctional variables or a function that has a variable that will then pass it on to another function, you can actually set it so that the functions are removed from memory when they're no longer being processed, thus allowing the memory for the variable that's no longer being processed to be freed for later resources. Again, global variables are accessed by all functions within a file, giving the programmer less control over how the global variables can change. Global variables are harder to manipulate and a little bit more complex and thus requiring a little bit more thinking on terms of the programmer's responsibility list. Normally you explain why you want to use a global variable instead of just local variables that again return. Sometimes it's okay to share the data between functions. Sometimes it's not. It all depend, depends on your organization and the type of program that you're writing. Data dictionary. A big thing here is so you may have several variables, but what do the variables do? What's the purpose of them? We normally create a data dictionary so that we can 
quickly and easily look up variable names for a specific program. That way, when you're working on the program, you don't have to wor remember every little variable name. You can actually just consult your data dictionary that, again, should be created the same time the project is created, thus allowing all key words or key topics to be able to be recorded and discussed at a later time. What happens if you have similar scopes? Sometimes being able to track the individual variables on four different scopes kind of allows a more of an understanding of where those variables are going. For example, order date. If we have several scopes or uh, functions that require an order date, we may use the same variable over and over variable name but not the actual same variable so that is definitely an option typically columns in a data dictionary include descriptions of the item the variable name how it's used the data type the module any errors that may be done they provide a lot of documentation for the data dictionary so that you don't forget what variable does what Error checking also is included with this. So moving on, compressed file formats. This is the last major item. Again, the term compression is used to describe the data reduction method to shrink the size of media files or data, such as audio or video files, to the point where they are no longer the same size as the original. These files, normally audio and video, seem to get fairly large and if you compress them, again, you can actually uh, save a lot of space. If you're only having a little bit of data where this isn't feasible, that's okay. That's also an appropriate response. If you're dealing with mass amounts of data, then data management is going to be extremely important just depends on your organization. We've already discussed there's lots of algorithms out there and sometimes these algorithms are also called codecs for our compression decompression codec c-o-d-e-c -E compressor decompressor kind of like mo and dum Some of our compressed file formats could be JPEG, could be JPEG-1. You can find additional compressed file formats on the internet, uh, all over the place. This kind of depends on where you're looking. JPEGs are definitely one big form. Lossy codecs are compression algorithms that actually eliminate some of the original signal to thus allow it to be compressed. Keeping in mind, this is estimation, so the true signal may or may not be the same one. Because that is a concern. Lossless or uncompressed codecs do not eliminate any portion of the signal, thus the likelihood of compression error is a lot less unlikely. So audios could also be waves and AIFFs, MP3s. These are all just some forms of audio codecs. A big one is MP3. That's an encodex. It's a it's a codex that's actually encoded in such a manner that allows people to actually save space while downloading or legally obtaining mp3s. If you've ever tried to read an optical disc you may have seen that the directory structure of the disc is a .cda and it actually appends to each track number. 
if you've tried to copy that CDA file, you discover that there's no audio there. The CDA is just a placeholder that says the data is here. And then it will define here depending on where it's actually at. One of the reasons for this is the type of modulation used. Part of that statistical analysis also does pulse code modulation that allow us to compress our data to name our data as well. Our wave is one, our AU is another. These are our just different types, all depending on your need. The more popular MP3 is lossy, not lossless. And again, that's why our MP3s may have some data missing. That could also be why some of our audio coming from some of our audio files regardless of where they're coming from could be lesser quality that'd be our mp3s being played some people may pick up on the fact they are lossy maybe not a lot but definitely some there are parts of the signal that are, again are eliminated the higher the data rate, the more fidelity the sound has become, more of the original signal is kept. Thus, the compression is pretty low. If you actually uh, don't have enough data to actually pick up the MP3, the sound quality starts getting affected. If you're doing more and more compression with mp3s every time it gets worse and worse and worse some audio formats could be uh, our mp3 our mpeg it just kind of depends uh, jpegs for video or for uh, photos it really just depends on what your uh, file you're looking at is doing we can actually look MPEG site up on the internet for more information, but this standard dates back from the early 80s. Other audio or other formats could, again, could be audio. MP3 is one of them. That's a lossy. And that's actually really it for this week. If there's any questions, please let me know. If there's anything I can do, again, please let me know. Uh, that's our data encoding and compression uh, lecture for this week. I hope you had a great time, and again, anything else I can do, please let me know. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to discuss some follow-up items. One of the first things is our APA formatting and citation. That goes for both our IPs and our discussions. Remember that we have to do all of our work according to APA manual, so if you're not sure how to do that, go online uh, you can type in APA formatting uh, if you don't want to look it up online you can go to any of the tutorial services we have a writing we have a library service they can give you additional resources on how to do APA formatting that's important that's not going away uh, in discussions same thing we have to be doing our citations in our discussions because one of the big things is for our citations we're building off of other people's works so it's a way for us to verify what we're claiming is supported by the literature so when I say something at the sky is blue you can take my word for it or if I provide a citation you can take an expert's word for it and then I built off of that so it just kind of increases your credibility. We should be at least citing in every uh, post or as much as possible. Because again, we're trying to link what we've done back to the literature. Same thing in our IPs. Every paragraph should be uh, tied to a source. 
Every paragraph is an idea, and every idea we need to have support within the literature. And I know at this level it's not that big of an issue, but you want to get in the habit of doing that so when you start doing higher level work, it's second nature. Also, length. We don't need posts that are great job. I mean, don't get me wrong, it does add to it, but when I start grading for posts, I'm not doing uh, full credit for those that have three posts and two of them are great jobs. I don't count the great jobs as a post. For our discussion board, I'm looking for three solid responses with citations. Uh, for our papers, I'm looking for three pages of content with citations. So what I mean by content is that's three papers on topic. That's not a cover page, that's not your reference page, that's three content pages. Uh, two if you're really good, but I'm really looking for three. If you're doing uh, diagrams, diagrams totally are okay, as long as you're doing them within APA formatting. Lastly, grading. Again, I grade off of heavily off of attempt, like if you're putting an effort into it. Like if you did two pages and you did a few citations and I could see that you were making an effort, I'll, I'll meet you. But if you post once or you did a page and a half with one citation, you know, that really isn't you making an effort. Uh, if you get stuck, don't get me wrong, some people a page is a lot. If you get stuck, you have plenty of resources to bolster up your paper. You can contact me, I'll help you. If you don't want to contact me, we have a writing uh, center, we have a tutorial, uh, tutorial center, we have plenty of help for you to get. If you need tutoring, there's a lot of tutoring out there. And uh, again, provided from the school. All you have to do is say something. For our tutorial lab, we have tutor uh, tutorial services for SQL, we have tutorial services for database, we have tutorial services for math, English, writing, research, library services. I mean, we have a great amount of tutorial services. And if we don't offer tutoring in a specific area, you can ask for it specifically, and they will find tutors for you. So you cannot use, you cannot get tutoring, because you can. If you ask for help, the school will get it. If you cannot get it from the school, there's other help. I will sit down with you. I will do as much as, as, much as I can with you if you need one-on-one. -on -one. If you need tutoring and you don't get tutoring, that's not a failure on my part. That's not a failure on the school's part. That's only a failure on your part because there's plenty of opportunities there. You have my number. You have my email. You have two emails from me. You have my cell phone number. You have plenty of ways to get a hold of me if you need help. And again, if you don't capitalize on help and you need help, that's on you. That's on you. Okay, there's plenty of help out there. All you have to do is say something. Thank you.